That winter, he regrouped in bulk. The next spring, massively reinforced, he took fire and sword across Central Asia. Five mobile army groups, 50,000 men, spread up the river valleys of Tajikistan in a search and destroy operation almost as far as China. In the autumn, they reunited at Samarkand. Samarkand, the most famous and glamorous city on the Silk Route. In Alexander's day, it was the chief town of Sogdia, today's Uzbekistan. Here, that September, took place one of the most fateful incidents of Alexander's life. Just outside the city gate lies the mound of the ancient town and the remains of the Sogdian palace. One night, Alexander held a banquet here. Among the guests was a veteran cavalry officer called Clytus. One of Alexander's father's generation, Clytus had saved Alexander's life back in the early days. With everyone drunk, the evening turned nasty. Alexander was harping on about his relationship with his father. Clearly felt very embittered and competitive. It's real Freudian stuff. My father never gave me the credit for my part in his victories, he said. Bore me ill will and jealousy. Clytus, who was one of the old guards, stood up. He said, everything you have achieved was based on what your father did. In fact, your father's achievements are far greater than yours. And he won them fighting men, not women. At this point, Alexander, who'd been relatively calm and unruffled, flew into a rage. He threw fruit at Clytus, tried to grab a spear in order to hit him, and kept calling out in Macedonian to give the alarm for the royal bodyguards to come in. Alexander's friends, meanwhile, had grabbed hold of Clytus, and they pulled him out of the door and actually got him across the moat over there. But just when everybody thought everything was over, in comes Clytus again. Here I am, Alexander. Alexander grabs a long spear from one of the guards at the door and runs him through. There's blood everywhere. And Alexander collapses onto the body in a drink-sodden heap in floods of tears. Some said Clytus got what was coming to him. And the king now suspended freedom of speech. But at the tomb of Tamburlaine, Another tyrant or hero, depending on your point of view, the words of an eyewitness came to mind, who spoke of the fear which people round Alexander now felt. He was a very violent man, with no regard for human life, who was said to be melancholy mad. Meanwhile, Alexander had still not crushed the Central Asian revolt, the ringleaders were holding out in the rugged mountains on the Tajik-Uzbek border. With their wives and children, they'd taken refuge on an inaccessible peak known as the Sogdian Rock. But where was the rock? It's never been found. We were sleeping at a village high in the mountains, hearing of our search for the rock, over breakfast, the local men showed us an old manuscript of the Alexander legend. There were old traditions, they said, that Alexander had come this way and that the lost citadel of Sogdia lay in the mountains close by. Stories like this are ten a penny in these parts, where you'll find Alexander's legend everywhere but my ears pricked up when they began to tell us about a mountain, a day's walk from their village. This their forefathers had told them was the Sogdian rock. They offered to take us there. It seemed worth a try. Thank you. 
The mountain lies right in the heart of ancient Sogdia. It's called Hazrati Sultan. It's 14,000 feet high, and the last few thousand feet form a sheer cliff. The Sogdians thought they were safe. Alexander was about to give up attempting to seize the Sogdian rock. But one of the ambassadors who came down from the Sogdians irritated him so much, Arian says, that he had to go on and seize it in pursuit of glory. The ambassador simply said, in response to Alexander's demand for them to surrender, just find soldiers who can fly. Nobody else is going to be of any concern to us. Alexander asked for volunteers with experience in mountain climbing. 300 men came forward, herdsmen from the Macedonian uplands. They took ropes, made pitons from iron tent pegs. The climb was difficult enough for our local guides, but Alexander's men did it at night, on the back face where they wouldn't be seen. On the other side, a narrow path led to a ravine which was massively defended. Thirty-two of Alexander's climbers died on the rock. Dawn the next day, Alexander's 300 mountaineers appeared over the top of the ridge up there, waving flags. The barbarians, said Arian, were absolutely staggered. They had simply not thought it was possible. Alexander's herald rushed up to their front line and shouted across to them. You better surrender now, he said. You see, I found the soldiers who could fly. The rebels gave up there and then. The story was remembered ever after as proof of Alexander's almost superhuman powers. <laughs> 